Well, we are back for another episode of Talking Church with Pastor Terry and Pastor Gabby. Good to have you. We're talking next gen today, and we've been chatting and laughing, getting started. So who knows where this is going to go? <laughs> who knows? <laughs> but thanks for being back. Yes. It's good to be back. Yeah. Summer. And in Minnesota, we have what's called the State Fair, and yep. that is coming up here in a short time. It's kind mm -hmm. of the way we end summer, end of August. So I'm really excited about that. Right. I saw there's some new state fair foods. Yes. I don't know if you saw those. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. They look yeah. amazing. Funnel cake, cheese curds. Mm -hmm. That's mm. a new food coming out. So mm -hmm. you'll find me at that stand. I Funnel think, cake, cheese curds. Yes. It's going to be interesting. I think the strategy is to eat and then go to sleep at night before you feel regret. <laughs> yeah. that's yes, like, that's true. That's like, that's it right yep, there. Yep, yep. But you walk so much that... You know, you're sweating, you're walking. All so, rationalization. Yeah. That's all just trying to justify the same. That's it. <laughs> we have a staff state fair day where we all go. So I'm very excited about that coming up soon. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not what people are here to listen. Well, maybe. but Maybe. We um, could do a review of state fair foods. Mm -hmm. we, we had conference this summer. I know we've had summer camps. There's lots of things that have happened. And so we could go a bunch of different ways. But a, a question that we're getting a lot, you know, we were talking about this, is about AI. How is that going to be incorporated? And Really, you, you talked about this, Terry, and maybe you can expand a little bit on on that. But there's a generation that's going to grow up with this. We're kind of like, ah, eh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect us. Right. right. But to talk about you, – you shared a, a breakout at conference a couple months ago. You have shared it in a few different backings. But just talk about some of the things you're hearing and how it's integrating yeah. and things like that. Yeah, it's such a new conversation. I think I just read a stat saying that 2% of Internet users use AI or chat GPT. Hmm. So they, I mean, it's so, so still really new. it's still very new. We're talking months new. Mm -hmm. um, but when you look at how much in a few short months AI has permeated society in regard to conversations and regulation and everything else, uh, I think the church classically takes a position of either attacking something they don't, they don't understand, trying to control it, or ignoring it. Mm -hmm. And Christ calls us to redeem it. It is simply another tool Spend. for us to utilize to advance the gospel of Jesus yeah. Christ. And I would argue that if the Apostle Paul had the, those kind of tools in his hand, he would be on the forefront of trying mm -hmm. to use it to advance the gospel. Now, I think the big question that we have to ask ourselves is, how are we going to integrate it and yet still maintain a moral authority when it comes to reaching the next generation? Mm. Because anybody can go on ChatGPT and say, write me a three-point sermon on Bartimaeus or write me a three-point sermon on not giving in to cultural pressure, and it's going to give you a good message complete with scripture and all. But at some point, we're going to see people who rely too heavily on that we're going to see that moral authority and that lack of spiritual authority in those kind of sermons versus the people who spend time discipling themselves in the Word and being discipled. Right. right. Yeah, and I think you can be accurate, but you can also miss the presence, right? Right. A hundred percent. And I think that's something that maybe maybe people have, have been struggling with processing, and people who are maybe against yeah, it, right, yeah. who are thinking, you, well, no, that's not, it's not inspired. It's like, well, right. we're not inspired. The word is inspired. Right. right. Um, Gabby, is it, are, are students bringing it up, or do you feel like it's mostly just leaders? Like, students are like, the yeah. world changes around us so much, we don't care. Yeah, I've never heard a student bring it up. Uh, I <laughs> we're have talking about this all the time. Go. We're going to look exactly. prophetic. Here we go. Exactly, yeah. We, I haven't heard students ask questions. I think... Again, I think students are going to grow up in it. It's going to be normal. It doesn't freak them out. To them, it's just a part of their everyday life. I think it's youth pastors asking the question, going, how does this impact my ministry? Yeah. How does this impact the future of the church? Yeah. And I think just like Pastor Terry shared, how do we redeem it? How do we integrate it? How do we use it effectively to expand the kingdom of God? And I think there's ways to do it well, and there's ways to not do it well. You know, we were just at a One Hope roundtable talking about AI and the future of the mm -hmm. church. And I was reminded at that roundtable that AI can't replace the gifts of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> AI right. can't replace the yep. Word of God, yep. the presence of God, one-on-one -on -one discipleship, relational discipleship. And so mm -hmm. I think it's a tool, but it's not the end-all be-all. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think it'll be interesting to see if the church almost idolizes AI as if that'll be the thing to grow their church. And in reality, it's a tool, but I don't think it'll ever be the thing that'll make or break your church. Right. I think you do have to go back to, as pastors, are we living on mission? Mm -hmm. Are we setting vision? Are we filled with the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. operating in the gifts of the Spirit and rooted in the Word? Um, but yeah, we have a lot of youth pastors asking the question. I have yet yeah. to hear a student bring it up. Yeah. That's so interesting. We, we talk a lot about, and a lot of people have said, well, I'm not going to touch AI. 
Right. Like I'm going to ignore it like I ignore social media or whatever. Mm -hmm. But you might not touch AI, but it's going to touch everything else that you touch. Right. It's going to integrate into your life to make it easier and you're going to like it. You're going to love it when at 3.15 every day, AI knows your rhythms enough from your Apple Watch that it orders a drink at Starbucks that you always get when you're stressed out because your heart beats at a certain level and your watch is picking it up. So it orders a drink before you get there and you're going to pay for it for you. Yep. I'm going to like that. And I think a lot of people (laughs) will like how AI makes their lives more comfortable and the world's more comfortable. I think us as leaders, especially in regard to the next generation, is we have to help them balance the conversation Mm. because the generation that gets a new innovation we struggle with it. We wrestle with it. Yeah. But the next generation balances it. Hmm. And we are that bridge to help them to figure out how to live redemptively with it. Yeah. You know, we're not talking about getting AI saved, but we are talking about utilizing it to advance the mission of God wherever mm. he plants us. That's really good. I was thinking of, you know, years ago, we started doing small groups on our Wednesday nights. And I remember, Pastor Terry, you said this. You said, as we go to small groups, this is going to expose our youth ministry to say, have we developed leaders well or have we not developed them well? And we moved into small groups and and we noticed, okay, half of our leaders, they're solid in discipling students and half have been exposed and they're not solid in discipling students. And we've been exposed in our leadership development of our team. I think AI might expose the church a little bit and church leaders a little bit to go, are you rooted in the word? Have you gotten students rooted in the word to be able to use discernment and biblical literacy while integrating AI as a tool and not the end all be all? So I'm just processing through that of how will it help build the church and where will it expose us as church Mm -hmm. leaders for where we need to be developed in our walk with the Lord and the way that we're discipling students in biblical literacy and cultural discernment. Yeah, that I mean, the word that you said that I think is the key word in all of this is discernment, right? Yeah. Uh, My grandma, who was just on the podcast a few weeks ago, um, she said the biggest thing that's scary for her is that AI can actually, I mean, this is happening right now, that it's it's interpreting people's voices and calling people and saying, like, I'm I'm I've been kidnapped and mm-hmm. there's a mm-hmm. ransom, you need to pay this ransom, yep. and I I've been I've been kidnapped. And it's the it, you hear it'd be like hearing oh like Shane's yeah. voice or something or Christina's voice. Yeah. And it sounds just like them. And so you get this right. phone call, you're in you have this decision to make, and what are you gonna say? Is this a prank? Is this not mm-hmm. real? But I think what we're we're, we're going to have to now do is teach our young people discernment. Yes. Is there are videos online mm-hmm. that are not real. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like it used to be, hey, there's videos online that are bad and you don't want to watch yeah. them because <laughs> right. you, you got to protect yourself online. Yep. Right. Well, now it's no longer just that, which that still is the case. Mm-hmm. But it's you have to learn to discern that somebody they I mean they could make one of the pastors look like they're saying something that is a false teaching, 100%. not true, yep. but it looks like they said it, and now they're listening and thinking yep. that they're yep. following after the things of God. Someone could, I mean, think of even right now, if somebody put a scripture verse and they said it's, you know, Obadiah 1-4, how many of us would really know yeah. if it's legit or not? Right. Again, right. maybe there's an Obadiah scholar out there who's like, oh, I have the book memorized. <laughs> He's watching this yeah. right now, <laughs> yeah. and he is lighting up that comment <laughs> right. section. But I, th- I think even that, you could put a quote of a verse that's not the right, right. verse. Yeah. But Absolutely. even more so, there's just all these things. So I think that that level of discernment, and I don't know if you guys have thoughts on how do mm-hmm. we teach discernment to people? Obviously, mm-hmm. the Holy Spirit provides yeah. discernment, but mm-hmm. are there ways that we can help people that my my favorite word right now is vigilant, right? Be vigilant, mm-hmm. be, yeah. be discerning. And I think that's something we need to focus more yeah. on versus right. just teaching yeah. education. A hundred percent. I mean... And discernment is very relative based on the people who are willing to accept things that are a bit more closer to the line in regard to morality and faith. But when you talk about cultural discernment and being discerning about what comes out there, we can't do it without biblical literacy. Mm -hmm. Correct. Biblical literacy becomes the filter and the standard by which we discern everything around us. And you can't have redeemed culture or kingdom culture without having biblical literacy as a foundation in the life of a young person. And by biblical literacy, I'm not talking about um, know the key verses, understand where the Old New Testament is, um, talk about the Gospels a little bit, know what Genesis says. But I'm talking about understanding how God relates to people in the Old Testament Mm -hmm. and how he's the same today, yesterday, and forever, and how that impacts what happens today. And how this verse speaks to that verse and how the New Testament fulfills the old and all that so that when a cultural moment happens or when they see something online or when AI goes sideways, they have their biblical literacy platform and filter and they take that moment and filter it 
do that. Yep. So what comes out at the bottom is kingdom culture or redeemed culture. Without that, we don't have biblical Christians. We have cultural Christians. Right. And these cultural Christians over here don't have biblical literacy. So when a cultural moment happens, what comes out at the bottom is something that agrees with them, but that just doesn't necessarily agree with the word. Right. Right. We have to teach students how to rightly divide the word of God and apply it to their life. And and we all have a part to play in that. Youth pastors have a part to play. Parents have a part to play. Senior pastors have a part to play. Connections pastors all have a part to play in raising up the next generation in the word of God. But what I think is interesting is right now, I don't have students asking me about the most relevant hot topic mm-hmm. in culture. Because we don't know it. Because we don't well, know it. Exactly. <laughs> they don't trust you anyways. Like, Who can I go ask? Gabby, yeah. Gabby and Terry, <laughs> they know everything that's cool and yeah. new and, and in. For and sure yeah. not. For sure not. But they are asking, how does this, how does this verse apply to my life? Yeah. Or how do I understand the book of Job? Yeah. Or what does revelation mean for me today? And how do I read how do I read that book of the Bible and understand it and apply it to my life? Mm-hmm. What they're asking is they're asking questions about biblical literacy mm-hmm. and cultural discernment. And that's what they're hungry for. And as youth pastors, I think we have to get past, is my youth ministry you know, culturally relevant and speaking to hot topics? Yes, those things will come, but is your youth ministry rooted in the word of God, teaching yes. students how to rightly divide the word of God and giving them exposure to have encounters in the presence of God? Yeah. Yep. And as students build that muscle and understand the word and apply it and are operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. when hot topics come, they will know how to navigate mm-hmm. those things because the focus has been mm-hmm. on the word and not just what is happening currently in culture. Right. Absolutely. And piggybacking off of that, I love how you talked about journeying with students and walking with them, mm. because if we give them answers, that doesn't give them the background on how to arrive at those answers right? or how to navigate their emotions or their thoughts when they hit certain circumstances right. in their life or where those things come their way. And I, can't, I don't want to understate the fact that journeying and teaching them how to walk their walk with God out, live their walk with God out in a real tangible way. And I know it sounds cliche and it's been said like, let's help young people learn how to live out their faith. Mm -hmm. But my goodness, the reason that I'm saying it today is because young people are taught answers more than taught how to process and journey through life with Christ and in step with the Holy Spirit. And I think we're going to hit that place that you mentioned, Gabby, to where we're going to see the haves from the have nots of faith because you're going to have a generation loaded with answers versus a generation loaded with experiences and journeys and encounters with the Lord. Mm. And there will be a stark difference between the two. And yep. who are the ones who will be responsible for that differentiation? Us. Yes. Yeah. Because what's instilled in them is what they value. Right. And we get to determine if our youth ministries and kids ministries and young adult ministries reflect a group of people that just simply have answers or mm-hmm. a group of people that have journeyed with Christ. Well, and, Great. And, and that's where I think we're at this new new form. I've We've talked about this before, but... It's almost like this new reformation almost mm-hmm. of, you know, back in the Protestant Reformation. I've heard, I've heard this at a lot of conferences recently, people referencing the Reformation um, to where the Catholics obviously took the scripture away from people and were basically saying, no, trust us, just trust us, indulgences, all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. And then obviously Martin Luther and what happened beyond that is getting the scripture back to the people. Mm-hmm. You're the priests. You are the people that should be leading yourself and helping lead others. You don't just rely on on the the priest at the the you know mass to do everything. Mm-hmm. You do things, right? right? And we had, you know, a couple weeks ago, Nathan Finocchio shared some of that. He shared that at conference as well. Um, but I think that I think that distinction is something that it's it's almost sad to me because even the start of this podcast, right? It, this is, you know, it's 80 episodes or something like that. Right at the beginning, we were talking about how to help people do church, right? Here's right. how we do youth yes. ministry. Right. Here's how we do care ministry. And here's how we do this. Now the conversations have shifted right. to what does the Bible say about this? How are we balancing this topic? Like it, it's about, mm-hmm. it's going to what does God say about this? And yes. it's interesting to see. I mean, more people are listening now, but I think those are the questions we have to be answering is the answers on how to do leadership, that changes every minute, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It changes in context. It changes on where you live. It changes on the type of students you're ministering to or the type of church that you have. But the word of God is unchanging. Right. And in the midst of this culture that's just being like, it's like a tornado going on around us. Yeah. I think experiencing 
going back to this rooted in the word of God, which, which and I, I know I'm being long-winded here, but I think that goes to youth pastors and young adult and next gen in general, but even lead pastors who feel ill-equipped to teach on those things. They yeah. thought, oh, when I went mm -hmm. to Bible college, right. they taught me how to run my growth track totally. and they taught me how right. to engage and look cool and I dressed like the way and yep. I did the sneaker thing. And, I did, and again, I'm, I'm not, that's not all it is. I know that there's hermeneutics. I know that there's New Testament, but it's almost like, yeah, those classes I need to get done. But once I get there, I'm going to do the model and yeah. I'm going to launch yep. big and yep. I'm going to get there. And people are realizing that doesn't work anymore. Correct. No. <laughs> and no. so they're launching churches and going, wait a minute. I got to yeah. find people that really understand yeah. disciple, yeah. Yeah. discipleship. And I think it's rooted in the shift that's happened in the church in the last three years. Mm -hmm. And that's that the attractional model is starting to die. And what's emerging is a more missional model. Right. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying the attractional model is going to go away, but you know, 20 to 25 years ago, we started being seeker sensitive. We started being more intentional about those who were trying to attract. Yep. And that changed everything from pews to chairs, the lights in the room, the LED screens, everything, coffee in the auditorium. Praise God, I'm about it. Yep. And that got people through the doors. I have testimonies of people mm -hmm. who would show up, hung over on a Sunday to greet and they weren't fully saved yet, but they were part of the community. And because they're part of the community, they eventually gave their life to the Lord, have been redeemed, and are serving in the church to this day. Yep. Such a needed thing. And the attractional model hits the church every, I don't know, three generations, four generations, because we desperately need it. We love getting stuck in our ways, y'all. And so we find a <laughs> groove, but if you stay in the groove long enough, it becomes a rut. Yep. And so the attractional model started to emerge, but with COVID and everything that changed, what emerged is a more on mission missional. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about missions, yep. but I'm saying what is our purpose and who are our people and how are we moving forward? Yes. And when people are coming into the church today to be able to discover for themselves how to balance things in life, to your point, uh, Logan, and how to um, wrestle with them in a, in, a, in a more purposeful way, if they come in and see only an attractional church mm -hmm. and are engaged with in an attractional way, which is a transactional way, mm -hmm. they're going to walk out empty. But if they come in finding a purpose in a people yep. and they walk out with those purpose in a people mm -hmm. and connect with those purpose in a people throughout their week, yes, we are going to see the church grow in ways that we haven't experienced before. But that means we have to make that mind shift. We have to die to certain idols that we've made out of attractional church right. if we're going to see more people entered into the book of life. Yep, yep. I think you have to let go of like a controlling mindset over your ministry too, because it's yep. okay. I'm called to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. So as a youth pastor, how am I equipping leaders to minister to teenagers? It's not all going to fall on me. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm accountable for my ministry. I'm responsible for my ministry, but how am I dispensing ministry? How am I raising up the next generation to lead. And we have students that have shared before, I don't feel fulfilled anymore. I feel stagnant in my faith. And there's a lot of reasons why they might feel that way. But when you boil it down, a lot of times what it comes down to is I've been consuming and there's no like output. There's no faith yeah. being put into action. And I have this hunger to be the one to lead. I want to lead the Bible study. I want to know how to pray for my friends. Yep. I want to be able to reach my family and if students are just coming and consuming on a Wednesday or on the weekend, at some point, they're not going to be rooted in that biblical literacy and cultural discernment because they've heard it, but they haven't been forced to live it out and put it in action and journey and study mm. and wrestle with their faith. You know, there used to be that statistic. I don't think it's accurate anymore, but 80% of students who grow up in the church will fall away from their faith when they hit high school. Mm-hmm or when they hit college, I'm sorry. I think that that's no longer totally accurate based on some statistics that the Assemblies of God have come out with. But why is that? Because their faith was their parents, their faith was their youth pastors, but it was never their own. They yeah. never journeyed, they never wrestled, and they never got opportunity to lead. I was just watching a documentary. Um, it's called Sheep Among Wolves. It's the second volume on one of the fastest growing churches in the world, which is in Iran. And they said, once you are saved, you're now helping lead another small group. And they're like immediately throwing you into it. Part of it is their culture and having house churches and small groups, and that's how they're growing in the underground church. But they were saying they're immediately getting people rooted in the word mm -hmm. and sending them out. They don't have like this 10 step plan of when you're here then you lead. Right. When you've hit this marker, now we release. They're going, we're releasing to you now, journeying with you along the way, correcting as we go, but you're going to do it. Yeah, and so I think some of that is 
there's liability, right? And totally. you know, you grow, you have a big church, and mm-hmm. I mean, there's conversations around here with River Valley. It's like, well, that's liability. That's this because yeah. it gets it gets big, and you right. it, you have a lot to lose, right? Mm-hmm. If if something, well, what if something happens, and what if what if they do something that that tarnishes you know, our, our church's name that then makes the government come after us. And again, none of these things I'm saying are easy or simple, right. mm-hmm. but I think it's a reality mm-hmm. to, yep. well, we're not going to put that person in leadership because what if, and I, yep. and I do think there's discernment, right? It goes 100%. back to that to say, ah, yep. oh, this person, I don't think it's right for us. Right. We don't put, we don't allow people to serve in youth or kids ministry unless they have a background check, 100%. right? It's not yep. like, oh, you were just saved. Come on, let's go. Absolutely. You know? um, so there are things that we can be intentional about, yep. but in the same way, I think it's be like, we have to equip people, and if they're not moving forward, I mean, you're talking about being stagnant in your faith, and then you go out on skid row. You go, man, <laughs> that, I, I, my heart was beating. It's crazy. I need to get into the Word. Right. I need to I need to learn yeah. this more. You go on a global team. You know, go to Iran and see what's going on there. It's like, <laughs> yeah. tr- try it. If, you yeah. want, if you're stagnant, go mm-hmm. over there. I bet you that the Lord, mm-hmm. you're going to pray extra hard. So mm-hmm. I think sometimes you need to put yourself in uncomfortable situations, not in like a testing way, but just right. you have to keep growing. Yep. Yeah. And I think when we think about putting people in those spots and the context that they're in, mm-hmm. they need to multiply today. Yep. Today. Mm-hmm. Or else it fails. Right. Um, but what we're talking about here isn't so much a microphone, a stage, no. a leadership title. It's access and opportunity. Right. And it's so easy to think leadership development and development of your faith and being put into a front of the house position equals a microphone and a stage. When a microphone and a stage is the lowest form of leadership development. Yeah. The greatest thing we can do, especially for the next generation, is give them access and opportunity. Logan, we talked about that a couple of years ago. Is there a place for them at the table and an opportunity for them to run with the call of God today? Yeah. Not when we say we're they're ready, but when they say, you know what, I want to try it out. Yes. Because who's to say if they're not hearing from God in the moment and we stifle it by saying, I don't think you're ready. I don't think you look like mm-hmm. what that person would look like. Mm-hmm. But I think access and opportunity, I think that's an easy way to balance that yes. and let them step out with what God's given them. But I think I think where we struggle in leadership development is actually our off ramps more than our on ramps. I think we're trained to do a really good job bringing pe- like building a funnel of getting people mm. on the journey. One of the things I think that we've done at River Valley that has been super helpful for us is we have a clear off ramp called the 500, which is sending 500 missionaries around the world. Yep. And so there's always people that are leaving, but they're leaving well. And yep. I think maybe there are people, whether it be in youth ministry or just church, they get them on the journey, but there's there's only so far you can go. There's only so many pastors you can hire. You know, even with multi right. there's only so many people that can be on the leadership team. Yep. And so I think people struggle with, they don't want people to leave. Mm-hmm. And because of that, then they end up using someone's gifts for two, three years. They yep. burned them out. And then they go out and, and they're, sure. they're leaving church or they yeah. hate God. And, yep. and, and I'm sure that's happened here too, yep. as, as much as we wish yeah. it wouldn't. But I do think that people need to develop off ramps of go be yeah. a, be a youth pastor somewhere else yeah. if you're called or yeah. go be a missionary or yeah. or get a job or take the transfer or do things but then also there are people that are called to stay and lead mm-hmm. and grow but i think especially right. when they're young it's like they're just going to stay in the same spot yeah. stay in the same spot stay in the same spot because that's as far as yeah. we're allowing them to go right sure i think some of it too with students is students lead the bible study in their school mm-hmm. or on a Wednesday, there's moments of prayer mm-hmm. releasing students to go pray with students. I don't think it has to necessarily be, and I don't think teenagers are, I'm not even hearing them asking for the opportunities of, I want this platform moment, or I want this specific serve team role in the church. They're going, are you teaching me to lead my friends? How do I reach my parents who don't know the Lord? Yeah. How do I build a boldness and confidence to hear from the voice of God and go speak that word yeah. over somebody in the youth ministry? Yeah. And to them, they're going, yeah. that's leadership. What I think is interesting is I'm hearing more and more students at camp or at conferences, they're feeling called to missions or pastoring, vocational ministry. They come back and they go, I think the Lord's asking me to get a degree in marketing so I can go on the mission field and reach the lost. Yeah. How do I live for the kingdom of God in the marketplace? I had a student tell me, God just called me into mission, so I'm going to go to school to be a nurse so I can go overseas to work in this hospital. 
I'm hearing less and less the vocabulary of I want the stage moment and the pastoral moment. And I'm hearing more and more, I want to be in the marketplace. Yep. I want to be in the medical field mm -hmm. because God has called me to ministry. That's and good. I think that's so interesting. And I also think it's beautiful that we're seeing a greater, I think, almost understanding of students in this generation of what it means to reach their friends. It's not just I only invite to the church. Mm -hmm. It's I go out and I'm, I am the church. Yeah. I'm going to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and with that, I've seen friends of mine that have felt that call, mm -hmm. right? But maybe because the church isn't doesn't have a development strategy for right. people like that, that while they're in medical school at their super liberal university, so they get pulled away because we didn't have a good strategy on how they can implement yeah. that. And so I yes. think even at churches and even for us, it's how do we connect people that are doing that right. that can help lead the way? Because for us as pastors, mm -hmm. what do we know how to do? We know how to pastor. Right. And so if they're spending a bunch of time around us, then they're going to learn yeah. how to pastor. But then they go yeah. into med school, and the, the same skills you need to pastor is not to be a doctor. Right. right. And so I think finding people that are, no, can you have this mm -hmm. doctor who can mentor some of our youth students that are right. called to be in the medical field and, and along the way? And again, it's mm -hmm. easier said than done, but when you look at a missional model, when you look at what you're talking about here, it's harder work. It, the attractional <laughs> model is way easier. Come listen to me preach. Yeah. I'm going to preach it's and so it's going to be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. But the missional model yeah. is much more of this, like the book of yeah. Acts, where you're having to, okay, there's a church over here, the church over here. Okay, Barnabas, he sells his land. We right. give it to those people. Great. Awesome. We're good for a little bit here okay we're gonna go start a church over here the people from Antioch you're gonna go to northern Turkey yeah and, and it's it's way more strategic but I think it's more adventurous and invigorating yes but you need the spirit to lead the way you do I think we have to answer the question as we because we I'll, I'll amen that and you're completely right um you have people called to the marketplace and go to their uber liberal university that has the reason they fall away is because they do have off ramps in those places that churches don't have wow. for individuals like that. Yep. So the world will have an off ramp if you don't have off ramps. Yep. The world will catechize, the world will disciple if you don't disciple. Yep. But there's always something going on. And a lot of our churches in the West are set up to make people look more like their church than they need to look like Christ. Hmm. And that's hard. Yeah. We call it a win when they do this, 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 this in what? our church. Yeah. What if we took all those away and said, it's a win when you witness to your family, right? when you go out on the street and you love your neighbor? Like, what if those become the metrics? Mm -hmm. right. But because growth and attractional demands a certain type of induction pathway, we do have those on-ramps built up to your point, but the same energy needs to be given to things that don't directly impact the numbers on a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. What would happen if we want somebody to the Lord and they went and attended another church, would we still call that a win? It's good. Yeah. Would we still call that a win? And would we still get them discipled fully knowing that they could go out and go attend yes. somewhere else or go do something else? Or would we say, no, 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 the goal is to keep them here. That question, until the Capital C Church can answer that question, I don't know if we'll have those specific off-ramps. I think it's that's really why good. you have parachurch organizations mm -hmm. because the church doesn't have that in place yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a hard question to ask, even as I'm going through and thinking of ways to disciple the next generation. Right. Would we still call it a win if they got saved and say they didn't bring any friends, but they went and they helped people on the street and yep. they loved their neighbor and all those other things. And even mm -hmm. though it didn't cause our numbers to go up, this person is bearing fruit. It's good. Mm -hmm. That question has to be answered, I think, before we hit those other areas. And that's not for us to figure out. Ha <laughs> ha. We get to talk <laughs> right. about it right, right now. But it's something that sits really heavy on my heart because it's something that's been easy to push to the side. Yep. But in an increasingly cause-driven society today yes. that wants to see results for the problems in society, we can't ignore yeah. our need to develop people to meet needs with, with being the hands of Christ in those spaces. I think what's encouraging right now, too, is I think this next generation of youth pastors and kids pastors and just next-gen pastors, these are the questions that they're asking. Mm -hmm. At River Valley Conference, we had a ministry design session in regards to next-gen ministry, and a lot of the conversation started to turn towards collaboration across the church at large, yeah. collaboration with other departments, collaboration with other churches, going, how can we link arms together to get the kingdom win and not just our own siloed ministry win. Mm -hmm. And I think that's beautiful because I think as pastors lean into that, we'll only see greater kingdom impact as we build together and that's not good. separately. Yeah, I was talk talking in our lead team meeting the other day, 
And when things are going really well, right, it's easy to not look at the metrics. Right. <laughs> it's easy. Like, or or I, I guess like you, you don't even have to look. You're like, I, I can feel it. It's going I can so feel good. Like the I know vibe the vibe of this moment. Yeah. The and Holy Spirit song. And then you and then you look at the metrics, and it's like, oh yeah, we're good. It's all good. Yeah. Mm. But then you don't look at your processes. And then when you stop looking yep. at your processes, you stop looking at your discipleship. So you stop true. looking at your discipleship. Ooh. So then what happens is you have this high for a while, but then it starts going the other way. And what do you start yep. to do? You start to look at your processes. You start to look at discipleship. And why do you do that? Because it's going down. Mm -hmm. right. Well, mm -hmm. we know that it's easy for things to go down and keep going down. Yep. So I would encourage people, if something's going well, really ask, why is this going well? Yeah. Understand what's happening. Yep. And then if it's not going well, like it's, you're kind of too late almost. And it sounds <laughs> sad. Like if, yeah. if you're struggling, you're too late. That's right. It's not the message, but, but I do think that that it can't be this like oh I'm, when things are going well I'm just gonna I'm it's all good we're feeling it it's we're we're you know we're grooving to your point but yep. then it becomes that rut and by it's too late to where yeah. you're looking around going I can't even get out of this anymore yes. right. so I think yeah. it's always asking yourself am I rooted in this biblical literacy it's going circling mm -hmm. all the way back to AI okay utilizing the tools ask those questions but youth aren't even asking the questions okay we'll learn about it in a way that can yep. benefit but don't let it control you. But also know that can you do those things with the lens of biblical literacy, with the lens of mm -hmm. not being a cultural mm -hmm. Christian, but being mm -hmm. a biblical one? Yeah, I think we can. Yep. But you can't wait for it and all of a sudden go, no, man, you can't react. this whole yeah, right. this whole reaction thing, like yep. right. it, it just went terrible. Now what do I do? Yeah. Well, it's over, man. Like it's the done, bro. sunk. You should have saw it coming. <laughs> yeah. It's like there's an iceberg. You all saw the iceberg. Yeah. Right. It's it's there. I'm sorry, I hope that's not too soon. Yeah. But like <laughs> yeah. but you guys saw the the iceberg. Yes. Like, and at the end of the day, it is. I love how you talked about those processes. Don't have a good night or a bad night at youth and not know why. It was yeah. a great night. Why? I don't know. God loves us. It was a bad night. Why? I don't know. Like, we yeah. need to know. And yeah. we need to know why we got there. And if the reason we got there is in alignment with the mission of God. It's so true. I think sometimes we can over-spiritualize things. You know, For it sure. was a great night because God moved in this way or it was a bad night because of X, Y, and Z. You know, when sometimes it's like, we didn't follow up with our youth leaders. We didn't send the email. We didn't communicate here. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> or it was a great night mm -hmm. because we put in the work and we mm -hmm. did the additional meetings and we followed through with new students and yep. we trained our leaders. We yep. did all the mundane yep. behind the scenes tasks that please pleases God when you do that yeah. and leads to incredible moments in the presence of God during your services. Yeah. I got to bring on Gabby really quick. Uh, a few years back, um, you were still a youth pastor at one of our campuses, mm -hmm. and uh, she had blown up the youth ministry. It was it was going. It felt good. When I want to feel good about myself, I would show up there. <laughs> and uh, she came to me once, and she goes, I kind of got this revolving do door of about 30 kids, 30 new kids, 30 kids aren't, aren't there, 30 new kids. And she really started to identify, okay, well, what's going on? And she began to go through all of her service and her processes, and she realized 30 kids were coming in before the lobby was set and ready to receive them because everybody else would be praying for the service mm -hmm. in the auditorium, but nobody was in the lobby to greet kids who decided to come uber early, like at five when service starts at seven. You know the parents, right? Yeah, oh yeah. right. <laughs> and so she made sure there were a couple leaders out there to greet them and meet them and set the atmosphere early, and your youth ministry grew. Right. Now, if she hadn't done that, she'd be like, look at this, God loves us. Mm -hmm. But it right. was simply honoring the processes and making the adjustments necessary mm -hmm. so that people found a place to belong. Yeah, that's so good. And yeah. it was it was awesome to see. Yeah, and it's caring about those little things. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know we're about to wrap up, but I'll open this can and just shut it. Um, <laughs> mm -mm. Sometimes we, we celebrate the metrics that are the wrong metrics, right? 100%. And we're thinking, that was an amazing night when... Are you what lens are you running it through? Yeah. Right. Are you good. running it through? This yeah. was amazing according to the word of God, because the church can yep. grow in in mighty numbers really quickly. Yep. That's not bad. You right. you having yep. a big service, you having an awesome conference. Right. I mean, the the conference of Pentecost in Acts two, right? Boom, mm -hmm. five right. like thousands of people added. Right. That can happen, but I think it's our metrics about us mm -hmm. or are they about mm -hmm. people? Do, yes. Did I feel good? Did people come up and everyone said, great message, that yeah. was amazing, that was awesome, you're so great? Or was it the outcomes mm -hmm. of the people that attended? And I think yep. that's the difference. If you're wondering, am I a shepherd or am I more of a leader? Like, mm -hmm. am, I, am I caring about myself or am I caring about the, the yep. other people? Yep. And I think you don't know the answer 
of whether the night was good or not until at least like the next day. Like, yeah, get emotional <laughs> distance like, on that, man. Like, so true. you know, it's like, I, it was amazing. It's like, you don't even know, you didn't even leave the building yet. Like you, <laughs> like you, could, I w- walked out from uh, one of our services. Uh, we had our seek week and I walked out and the, everything was great. It was amazing. And I saw Pastor Jesse goes, man, the alarms were going off. I'm like, I didn't even know that. <laughs> it's like, maybe there's something going on. Maybe there's a car fire you in the parking know. lot. You don't even have right. any clue. You it's don't like, know. tonight's amazing, man. Now, opening up that can a little bit further just yeah. for a second. Yeah. Let's yeah. take that lid off and throw it over there in the corner. Um, how many successful nights are done by hitting a bullseye that God didn't set for us? Right. right. So we true. hit a bullseye that, to your point, makes us feel better about what we do but it doesn't get anybody else into heaven or anybody new into heaven yeah. or anybody closer to Jesus. And going back to those processes, I think is so vital to make sure that we aren't celebrating things that God doesn't intend for our church. Right. Like that's a, that's a whole nother podcast, yeah. Yeah. especially in regard to youth ministry yes. and kids ministry and young adult ministry. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. I was just talking to somebody the other day that was saying so many times we're asking God, what is your plan for me? like for my life so I can feel good and feel like I succeed in your eyes. What's your plan for me? Instead of just asking the question, God, what's your plan? And I'll just align my life to your plan because my life isn't about me. And in the same way with our ministries, God, what's your plan? What's your heart? What have you laid out in scripture? And I align my ministry to your plan. Yes. I don't align align my ministry to my personal preference, Mm -hmm. to my platform, to gaining influence. I align my ministry to God's plan. Yeah. And it's as simple as that. 100%. We really can sometimes overcomplicate things in ministry, personally, when it comes to what pleases the heart of God. Yeah. Well, I've got I've got to shut the lid until next time, our okay. next conversation, but I think it's so true Gabby that you said it's I mean, Jesus when he was walking on earth, his disciples still tried to make it about them. Well, if we got to right. go bury the the dead person. No, mm-hmm. no, no, let the dead like there's yes. a there's a mission mm-hmm. that I have for you. Well, can we do this? No, 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 you can't do that right. because I have something for you today. Mm-hmm. Right. You look at the Holy Spirit. No, d- just move forward mm. because this is my plan, and I love that. I think that's such a reminder for us in the way we lead our ministries, in the way we lead ourselves. is, God, what is your plan? Mm-hmm. Not how can I fit? How can yep. I make it work? How can, like, if, if, like, if your plan includes me being rich, <laughs> if your plan, in, you, you know that very rarely when we ask, our plan is never suffering like Paul. It's never suffering no. like, like yeah. God, would you no. please just let me suffer? Would you please? If but then so but true. he says it's better that way. Like, why would we not ask that? Because we're selfish. I know. God, so. can I get more likes? Yeah. God, will this date just go well finally? Yeah. Can I get somebody with six figures, six foot? Come on. Come on. Come Let's on. go, God. Yeah. No, it's so true. But we're all selfish. And, uh, and that's and how so we're gonna, we can't yeah. let him play there, Logan. Jesus <laughs> is better than our selfishness. There you go. Jesus that is enough. Is, that's it. And uh, we will finish this conversation next time <laughs> when we come back. It. But thanks for being here, Talking Church, <laughs> and uh, just excited for all God's doing in our next-gen ministries Amen. and next-gen ministries all around yes. the world. Amen. Thank you.